Hello, I want to join Pastor Stephen in welcoming you here today. We're so glad that you're joining us for Celebration Online as we begin a new series titled The God of the Broken. The God of the Broken. I want you to take your Bible or Bible app and turn with me to the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 1 will be our text for today. I want to ask you this question as you're turning in your Bible. Have you ever watched the movie, The Ten Commandments, starring Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner and lots of others way back in the 1950s? Uh, most people have watched that movie. It actually comes out almost every Easter. And I think oftentimes of some of the lines from that movie. One of my favorite lines is from the Pharaoh who said, so let it be written, so let it be done. But one of my wife's favorite lines is from the woman Nefertiri, the queen or the princess of Egypt, who was in love with Moses. And she said, oh, Moses, you stubborn, splendid, adorable fool. Sometimes I think my wife thinks that about me, even if she doesn't say that about me. Well, the Ten Commandments actually tells the story of the book of Exodus. Today we're going to begin a study of the first four chapters of the book of Exodus, again in this The God of the Broken series. And I want you to follow along as I read the first seven verses of Exodus chapter 1. The Bible says these are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, or who used to be named Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher in all. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. And in time, Joseph and all his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Most of the books of the Bible have one dominant or overarching theme. For instance, several years ago, we studied the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the book of creation. And in Genesis, we learned about the creation of the world, about how God created the heavens and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and all the galaxies around them. And then how God created the animals and the human race. Uh, somebody asked me, well, what was in God's mind when he was creating a man and a woman? I said, well, I think it was like this. God created man and then said, I think I can do better. And that's when he created woman. That may be how God created woman as well as man. Then we read about the recreation of the world with Noah and his family surviving the flood. We read about the, the creation of various languages and ethnicities at the Tower of Babel. And then we learned about the creation of a new nation with the call of Abraham. All throughout the book of Genesis, we find God creating, creating in so many different ways. But while Genesis is a book of creation, Exodus is the book of redemption. In Genesis, we discover how humans got into sin and struggled with sin. But in Exodus, we learn how God takes humans out of sin and out of bondage and slavery in their lives. In fact, that's one reason that the book of Exodus is given this title. Exodus is a Hebrew word that, that actually means the way out. It teaches us about how the Israelites found their way out of slavery and bondage after over 400 years in Egypt. And it also teaches us how we, as a people of God in our day, can find our way out of slavery and bondage in our lives. So we're going to be learning uh, through this book in the Old Testament about the emancipation of God's people, about the equipping of God's people, and about the empowering of God's people. Now in our study, the book of Exodus, we're going to be learning how to follow the Lord in new ways to new levels in our lives. It says in Exodus chapter 13, verse 20, that when the Israelites left Egypt, the Lord guided them by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And so we're going to learn how to follow the Lord in a similar way in our day and time. Not that we expect the Lord to be a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, but there's some tangible ways we can discern the direction of God for our lives, how to follow Him and how to get closer to Him, how to experience His best in our life. And that's going to be our thrust of our study as we study through this Old Testament book of Exodus. Now, in the initial chapters of Exodus, we discover that God cares when his people experience brokenness in their lives or brokenness in their circumstances or brokenness in their relationship. In fact, when we get to Exodus chapter 3, we'll learn about Moses' great encounter with the Lord at the burning bush, the burn bush that was on fire but never burned up. And here's what the Lord said to Moses on that day. The Lord told Moses, I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's obvious that God cared about what people were going through in that day and time. And the same God who cared about the Israelites in that day 
still cares about the situations and conditions and relationships of people in our day. So here's our question. What kind of difficulties are we facing in our day and what will help us to overcome them? There's some answers to those questions that we find right here in the first seven chapters of the book of Exodus. To begin with, during difficult times, we need to reflect on our identity with the Lord. We need to think about who we are in Christ and what God has done for us in our lives. In the opening verses of Exodus chapter 1, we read about a man named Israel who used to be called Jacob. Uh, God mentions Jacob there and the sons of Jacob who traveled from Israel to Egypt during the time of famine. Uh, There in Egypt, they discovered their long lost brother Joseph had had risen from being a prisoner and a prison to being the prime minister of Egypt. Now you notice in verse five that that, that God knew exactly how many of Jacob's relatives were now residing in Egypt, 70 family members. The primary thing I want to point out to you is that God has some special people in the world that he considers to be his children. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor, well, aren't we all God's children? No, no, we're all God's creation, but not all of us are God's children. In fact, according to Jesus, some people are children of the devil. You don't want to be one of his children, while some people are children of God. And according to Jesus, the only way you get to be a child of God is by making Jesus himself to be the Savior and Lord of, one, of your life. You see, a person can be a creation of God and still not be a child of God. I mean, God created all kinds of things. He created rocks and grass and trees and birds and bees and and insects and animals and all kinds of things. But that doesn't make him their children. That doesn't make them his children. That makes them his creation. In the same way, God created all kinds of human beings, but those who are his children are those who made Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of their lives. Now, sometimes even the children of God, though, can act like the children of the devil. Like the man mentioned in the beginning verse of our text, the man Jacob. Jacob was someone who was the grandson of Abraham who caused a lot of trouble in his early years, stealing his brother's birthright, stealing his brother's blessing, and dividing their family. But, but eventually, Jacob became Israel. He became a man of God. This man who had been a deceiver was transformed in a supernatural way because of a supernatural encounter with the Lord. Now, Jacob, on that day of his encounter with the Lord, was actually fearful. It's in Genesis chapter 32. He had heard that his brother Esau was coming with 400 men to apprehend him. And and, and here's what happens. We read about how Jacob had a supernatural, life-changing encounter with the Lord. Here's several things we learned from Genesis 32. Number one, our lives, circumstances, and relationships are changed when we embrace God's promises. In the opening verse of Exodus 32, Jacob again has learned that Esau is coming with with 400 men. and, And the Bible tells us that Jacob gets really, really scared. Now, we talked about being frightened last week in in the Easter sermon about how so many people struggle with fear in our day and time. People fear losing their health or their wealth. They fear losing their job or their joy. They fear losing their salvation or their sanity. They fear losing their friends or their family members. Uh, So many people struggle with fear. Now, some people, I know some men who who says they're, they're not afraid of anything. The only thing they're afraid of is someone thinking they might be afraid of something. But most of us struggle with fear. And Jacob was struggling with fear, and so he prays. The first time we read about Jacob praying, he prays, and he reminds the Lord of his promises to him. Jacob said in Exodus 32, verse 12, Lord, you promised me. I will surely treat you kindly, and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. And Jacob's prayer reminds us that God has promised us lots of things. He's promised us his presence to be with us. He's promised us his provision. He's promised us his protection. He's promised to carry out his purposes and plans in our lives. So let me ask you, have you ever broken a promise? Sure you have, and so have I. I tell people my biggest lies. to tell my wife, honey, I'll be home in 30 minutes. Well, I know it's going to be longer than that. Well, God has never broken a promise. If he's promised you something by his word or by his spirit, you can count on the fact that God is going to keep his promises because the Bible says in Psalm 145, verse 13, the Lord always keeps his promises. And just knowing that, helps us to deal with the circumstances and challenging situations of life. Also, our lives, circumstances, and relationships are changed when we encounter God's presence. The Bible says in Genesis 32, 24, that Jacob was all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the, the dawn began to break. Now picture this in your mind. It's a dark night. Jacob is all alone. He knows that Esau is on his way with 400 men. He's frightened, and all of a sudden, somebody grabs him from the dark. How would you respond to a situation like that? 
Right before I became a Christian, I was actually stumbling home from a bar and some guys jumped me and they just beat the mess out of me. And it always stuck with me. And my, I never told my wife the story, but after we got married, when I was coming home late and she decided to surprise me. And so she hid behind the door. And when I walked into our apartment, she jumped on my back thinking to surprise me. I just took her and I threw her across the room and she spat it against the wall. And I've been apologizing for the last 40 years for that. I don't believe a man ought to ever lay hand on a woman, but here's what I do. That's the kind of fear that Jacob experienced. All of a sudden, someone grabbed him from the dark and he was in the wrestling match of his life. But in that match, he encountered God himself. In fact, Jacob said in, in Jacob 32, verse 30, Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face. Let me ask you, when's the last time you had a face to face encounter with the Lord? When's the last time you really experienced the powerful presence of the Lord in your life? When's the last time you felt like you were wrestling with the Lord over some situation or some challenge in your life? Now, we all ought to have had an initial encounter with the Lord on the day of salvation, the day we recognized our need for Jesus, repented of our sin, put our faith and trust in Him, and His presence came into our life. For me, that happened on February the 25th, 1970. I don't know when that happened to you, but when you have that initial encounter with Jesus, that's when your life begins to change. But we also ought to have continual encounters with the Lord as we worship Him, as we pray to Him, as we study God's Word, as we, as we gather with other believers to worship Him. And by the way, when we encounter the Lord, the manifest, profound presence of the Lord. We've always got to come to the place where we surrender to the Lord. That's what Jacob had to do. He had to surrender his will and his ways to the Lord. And that's when the Lord began to transform him from being Jacob to the deceiver to Israel, the great leader of God's people. And then our life circumstances and relationships are changed as we experience God's power in our lives. The Bible says when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of his socket. That shows you the power of God right there. Later on, he asked, what's your name? And Jacob, Jacob said, my name is Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Now, that's important what the Lord said to Jacob on that day. Jacob's name meant Israel heel snatcher or deceiver in the Hebrew language. But the name Israel meant Prince of God. So why did God change Israel's name? Uh, Jacob, why did God change Jacob's name? Because he had changed his character. And that's what happens when we begin to experience the power of God in our lives. Our character begins to change. Our destiny begins to change. Our identity begins to change. We're no longer who we were. We are changed by the power of God. So let me ask you, what kind of work has the Lord been doing in your life? In what ways has he changed you? If you were asked, uh, if you were to say, my name used to be this, but now it's this because of the presence and power of God, how would you fill in the blanks? You might say, my name used to be victim, but now God calls me victorious. My name used to be fearful, but now God calls me faith-filled. My name used to be uh, oppressed, but now God calls me overcomer. My name used to be compromised, but now God calls me conqueror. You fill in the ranks to demonstrate what God has done in your life. But here's what I want you to know. In the opening verses of Exodus, we're reminded of, from the man, story of the man named Jacob that God can transform any person and every person. He can change our identity. And in the most difficult times of life, we got to remember not what we've done or how we messed up. we got to remember who we are in the Lord. So during difficult times, we need to remember our identity with the Lord. Also during difficult times, we need to remember our history with the Lord. Let's go back to our text, Exodus chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says in all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. Now, Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and he was the favored son of Jacob. And his other brothers knew that, and his other brothers hated him because of that. You read about Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 37, and then Genesis 39, 40, 41, and follow him. And here's what you learn. Jo jo Joseph went through some hardship because of his brothers' animosity towards him. But here's what you learn. Even during difficult times, we can experience the protection of God in our lives. The Bible tells us in Genesis 37 that Joseph's brothers were so envious of him that they set out to kill him. They were going to hurt him and harm him and even kill him. While they captured him and thrown him into a pit, and while they were contemplating how they were going to kill him, actually some Ishmaelite traders came along and they sold their own brother, Joseph, into slavery. Now, being a slave was certainly not a bad, 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 good option for Joseph, but it was a better than what the other option was. You see, the Lord protected Joseph even when his own brothers were seeking to harm him. I wonder how many times have you come through 
uh, situation in your life and, and recognize how God protected you in your life. The, the outcome may have not been what you wanted it to be. The situation or circumstances may have not been what you wanted it to be, but it was God protecting you in your life. Maybe you were driving through an intersection and another someone, someone else in another car ran a red light and almost hit you or, and you knew it was the Lord protecting you. Or maybe you're about to head to a certain place and you were hindered from leaving at that time you wanted to leave. And when you did, you noticed a tragic accident had occurred that perhaps could have included you if you had left earlier. There's all kind of ways that sometimes we need to remember this is how God's been protecting us in our life. The Bible says God is our refuge and our strength and always ready to help in time of trouble that he takes care of his people. And that was certainly true in the history of Joseph. Even during, even during difficult times, we can experience the protection of God in our lives, but we can also experience the power of God in our lives. When you get to Genesis 39, in the story of Joseph, first Joseph was, a, Joseph was a slave, but God blessed him as a slave, and he became the very best of the slaves there. And, and then when he became the, uh, the head of his, uh, of his master's household, uh, the master's wife came on to him, and Joseph rejected her and resisted her. But because of that, uh, she falsely accused him, and he was thrown into prison. But even there in prison, Joseph was acknowledged, and he was affirmed. And he, he was uh, made the leader over all the prisoners. Here's what I'm telling you. In Genesis 39, Joseph's going one dip through one difficulty after another but even then the lord jo the lord blessed joseph even in the midst of his difficult circumstances Throughout the chapter of Genesis 39, 39, we read how the Lord was with Joseph and how the Lord blessed Joseph and how the Lord promoted Joseph and all those kinds of things, which reminds us that even the most difficult and disastrous times of our, life, of our lives, God's power can still be working in great ways in and through our lives. It's certainly evident in the life of Joseph. And then even during difficult times, we learn from Joseph that we can count on the provision of God for our lives. In Genesis 40 and 41, we're told how the Lord rescued Joseph from prison and eventually caused him to become the prime minister of Egypt, the greatest riches to rags to riches story in all of history. And the Lord blessed Joseph because of his faith, bringing him from being a prisoner to being the prime minister. And all throughout Joseph's life, whether he has been rejected by his brothers or sold into slavery or, or uh, 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 living as a slave or being lied about by a scorned woman or cast into prison or forgotten about others, the Lord was still protecting Joseph and providing for Joseph and turning his tragedies into victories. And, and the Lord wants to do the same in our lives as well. We just don't understand. God's always working behind the scenes to accomplish his way and will for our lives. Joseph said to his brothers near the end of his life, he said, God turned into good what you meant for evil. And Paul said it like this in Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. You see, we need to remember what God has done, is doing, and still plans to do in and through our lives. Sometimes we need to reflect on not just our identity with the Lord, but our history with the Lord about how God has come through time after time after time in our lives. One time a man said to me, he said, to Pastor, my wife sometimes gets historical with me. I thought he was referring to the fact that she got emotional. I said, you mean she gets hysterical? He said, no, she gets historical. She keeps bringing up the things I've done in the past. Well, sometimes we all ought to get historical. Not to bring up our wrongs or our defeats or others in the past, but remember what God has done in times past. And the same God who worked mightily and powerfully in our lives in times past is going to work, going to work mightily and powerfully in our lives in the future. And then here's the third thing we learn from these first seven verses of Exodus 1. During difficult times, we need to refocus on our ministry for the Lord. The Bible says in Exodus 1, 6, and 7, In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Now, we can see from these verses that the population growth of the Israelites while in Egypt was actually carrying out God's first command to humankind, which is to go forth and multiply. But also, it reminds us that the, the Lord wants His people to be involved in replicating themselves and multiplying their impact and influence in our world. Now, in those days, people replicating themselves was obviously a reference to having children. And that's an important aspect of life. Most people feel called to have children or to adopt children, to give birth to children in order to care for others and help preserve the human race. In those days, it was also a way of replicating one's faith or carrying on one's faith. In a world framed by secularism and hedonism and all kinds of religions, one of the primary things, one of the primary objectives of the Israelites was to pass on their beliefs about having a relationship with Jehovah God. And, and, and to do that, they, they had children. They taught those children the beliefs and the behaviors of their faith. 
Now, we as Christians are to be doing the same with our children. We're to be passing on our faith to our children, but we're also to be passing on our beliefs and our faith to others as well, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers, and our neighbors. I know that because of what Jesus said to his disciples after rising from the grave. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations. The word disciple means a student and a learner. And it's a reminder to us that all Christians are to be disciples. We're to be passing on our faith to others. Jesus said another way in John 15, 8, he said, And my true disciples produce much fruit, and this brings great glory to my Father. Now let me ask you a question. What is the fruit of an orange tree? Well, the obvious answer is it's an orange. What is the fruit of a banana tree? The obvious answer is a banana. What is the fruit of an apple tree? The obvious answer is an apple, right? I'm sure you've got those answers correct. So what is the fruit of a Christian? It's another Christian, another person one to faith in Christ, another person disciple to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, like the Israelites reproduce themselves in their day in the land of Egypt, we're to be reproducing ourselves in our day through making disciples. How do we do that? We do that by serving others, getting involved in serving God and serving others with our time, our talents, our abilities. We do that by sharing our faith with others, about telling people who the Lord is to us and what the Lord has done for us, how He's changed our life and how He can change their lives. And we do that by discipling others, mentoring others, taking others alongside of us, finding others that are new to faith and helping them grow in their relationship with the Lord and their walk with the Lord. And if we will be faithful in doing those things, serving others and sharing our faith with others and discipling others, the people of God in our day can become strong and prosperous in our day like the people of God did in the days of the beginning chapters of the book of Exodus. When we become who the Lord's called us to be and do what He's called us to do, we'll have a powerful impact on the culture around us in our day. Let me just close with two verses. The Lord said to His Old Testament people in Exodus 34, This is the covenant I'm going to make with you. I'll perform wonders that have been never done before. And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display through you. We're going to learn how to experience that, how to express that in our study of the book of Exodus. And then it says in Psalm 105, verse 43, God brought his people out of Egypt with joy, his chosen ones with rejoicing. And what God did in that day, he wants to do in and through our lives in this day. When I think about growing and making disciples and, and becoming powerful in the land, I think about a guy by the name of Roy Robertson. Some years ago, I was in Colorado Springs with my wife, Vicki, and we went to visit the headquarters of the Navigators there. And while we were there, I learned the story of Roy Robertson. Roy Robertson was actually in the Navy, the U.S. Navy, and his ship decked there in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December the 6th, 1941 the day before the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. Roy Robertson was a professing Christian, but he really didn't have a strong identity with the Lord. He didn't have a lot of history with the Lord, and he certainly hadn't experienced much of the victory of the Lord in his life. But he went to a Bible study that night because, I mean, that's what Christians are supposed to do. In the Bible study, as a, the leader began the study, he said, I want everybody here to quote your favorite Bible verse and make sure it's different than a verse someone else has quoted. And Roy Robertson began to sweat. He began to perspire. He's thinking, man, I've been in church all my life, and I, I can't even think of one Bible verse. Uh, they went around the circle, getting closer and closer to him. And one guy after another, one sailor after another, quoted a Bible verse. And they were getting closer to Roy Robertson when all of a sudden he remembered John 3, 16. He said, I remember that verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'll quote that verse. But the guy right in front of him quoted that verse. So when it came to Roy Robertson, he didn't have any scripture to share. He felt so embarrassed, so defeated, as he went back to his ship that night. The next morning, he was awakened early in the morning by the sounds of aircraft coming over the harbor, by the sounds of guns firing, and he and his other shipmates ran to their guns. But because they weren't expecting an attack from the Japanese Air Force, they only had blank ammunition in their gun. In fact, for the first 15 minutes, they fought back against the Japanese with blank ammunition and the, before they could get real ammunition into their guns. And the whole time, uh, Roy Robertson said, the Lord was speaking to him and said, Robertson, this is what your life is about. You've just been firing blanks for me. And that day, Roy Robertson made a commitment to the Lord. He said, Lord, if you'll help me survive this day, 
I'll really dedicate my life to you so I can be mildly used of you. And that's what he did. Later on, he met a guy by the name of Dawson Trotman. They formed a navigator's ministry, which became a great ministry on college campuses, reaching college students, discipling them to become real followers of Jesus. Here's what I want you to know. What God did with Roy Robertson's life, what God did with the Israelites, he wants to do in and for and through your life and my life. And he will do that when we learn, when we remember our identity with him, when we reflect on our history with him, and when we take up the ministry he's called us to be a part of in our lives, in our day. I want you to pray with me right now. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask you to ask yourself this question. What does God really want to do in, for, and through my life? What does God really want to do in, for, and through my life? Through this study, the God of the broken, we want to help you to discover the great plans and purposes God has for your life. Now, here's what I know. You can't begin to find and fulfill God's purposes and plans until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can't have a relationship with Jesus Christ until you've invited Him into your life to become the Savior and Lord of your life. If you've never done that right now, would you pray with me in your heart? You say, Pastor, what do I pray? Just pray these words and really mean them. Pray, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And today I'm asking you to come into my life to forgive me of my sins and begin the process to transform in my life. Take away my shame and my guilt, just like you did with Jacob. Help me make it through the difficulties of life, just like you did with Joseph. And help me to live an impactful life, like you did with the Israelites of that day. And for all that you have done, are doing, and will do, I'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, again, I want to thank you for joining us today for Celebration Online. I do want to encourage you to do this. I want you to take, I want you to go on your phone or on your laptop to, or on your tablet to webcc.info. That's our digital worship guide. Go to webcc.info. Go to the My Decision tab. And if today you pray for me to receive Jesus as your Savior or to recommit your life to the Lord, if you want information about Celebration Church or if you want to let us know how we can be praying for you in the coming days, please go there and let us know. We care about you. Uh, no matter where you live, no matter where you're from, and we want to be here to help and assist you to become everything God's called you to be so you can do everything God's called you to do in this life and in the life to come. Lord, bless all the people who participated in this service today in incredible ways in the coming days. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And that was an incredible start to the God of the Broken series from our lead pastor, Dennis Watson. There's one thing that he said to me that stood out is that God can transform everyone and anyone, but it begins with a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, just now, Pastor Dennis led us in a prayer, and if you said that prayer along with him, let us know. Go to webcc.info, click on the Make a Decision tab, and click on the decision that you made today. We love to follow up with you. We love to pray with you and to journey with you as you follow the Lord. Now, before you leave today, three things I wanna encourage you to do. The first thing is go to WebCC, let us know about that decision. The second thing that I want you to do is subscribe to this channel. Now, wherever you're watching this from, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Instagram, make sure you subscribe so you know when we release new content and upcoming sermons. And the third thing is this, let someone know about this sermon by hitting the share button. Whatever platform you're looking at it, maybe you're gonna copy a link and share it, send it in a text message, send it in an email, share it on your own page, let people know about this message because this message has potential to transform and change people's lives. Thank you so much for joining us here at Celebration Online. I just can't wait to see what God is going to do in the coming days. We continue this God of the Broken series. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.